Hi, so uh, today I'm going to be speaking about um, some quick wins uh, for PageSpeed. Uh, actually, that's the talk um, title that I've submitted, but the real title of my talk is Web Performance for Lazy People, like uh, me. So um, uh, let me just uh, speak a bit about myself. My name is uh, Tejas. I make terrible jokes. You'll find a lot of them. Feel free to laugh and uh, you know, make me not feel so bad, but uh, I love Clojure and I love uh, JavaScript. Um, I work at Quintype, and uh, that's my credentials over there. So I've listed this talk as a maybe beginner to intermediate uh, talk. I think there's been a lot of uh, uh, talks over this year's JSFU and last year's about things like progressive web apps and stuff like that. But I wanted to kind of get back to some of the basics of what you can do to make your app uh, faster. And in particular, I was looking for a few of the quicker things that you can do without rewriting your entire application and maybe porting it from one language to the other, what are some of the smaller things that we can actually do which will uh, take us a, a long way? So um, like uh, most uh, important or great talks, I'm gonna start with an important uh, quote. So if debugging is the process of removing software bugs, then programming must be the process of putting them in. This is from uh, Edgar Dijkstra, um, you might remember him if you studied um, uh, computer science for the Dijkstra algor algorithm. So the first thing is, why should, I, why should I care? Right, so let me answer this uh, in the context of, of what, what um, I do, which is that uh, we are sort of a software for um, a lot of India's most popular uh, news sites. You might not have heard of us, but we uh, power a lot of news sites uh, behind the scenes. And the digital news space is incredibly competitive and maybe even worse than a lot of industries, bounce rates are incredibly high. Just imagine how you interact with news. You're probably scrolling through your Facebook feed and you might see something important. You might click on it and then you've forgotten all about it and you're on to the next thing. And because we deal with a lot of news, many of our readers are from very rural parts of the country. We've worked with some uh, customers whose main users are in like um, very rural parts of uh, where the network connection is terrible and the, and the devices that they're working with are also pretty um, bad. Yeah, so most of you would have gotten bored by now. So that, that, uh, this is what that experience is for, for a lot of people, where they kind of come to a big white screen and they don't see anything. I, I held on that slide for about four seconds, and I, and I know that most of your heads are like, okay, what's going on? Did something go wrong over here? Most of your users, like around 60% of your users will actually drop off if your page load is four seconds or above. Different reports have uh, different numbers for this. And this is the first reason why you should care about your page load speed. And unfortunately, this is pretty brutal. Almost for every 150 or 200 milliseconds that it goes either way, you'll see that, your, that, that the number of people who stick around and actually consume your content changes. And the second reason, and this is an um, update that uh, Google has pushed in July 2018, is that Google is now using your page load time as an indicator into the PageRank algorithm for, uh, you know, so they're, they're giving you benefits if, you've, um, if, if your page speed is good, and they're penalizing you if it takes a long time to, um, to load your page, right? I don't know how many of you have noticed this new um, uh, page, uh, this new um, uh, area coming up in the Google PageSpeed uh, indicator, uh, indicator site recently, which uses the Chrome user report, ex uh, Chrome user experience report, to actually tell you how fast or slow your page is on actual users. This is not an estimate, this is actual users and uh, the time it took for them to experience your site. And like a lot of um, things, Page speed also is probably governed by the Pareto principle, right? Which is otherwise known as the 80-20 rule. You can probably do about 20% of the work and get about 80% of the benefits. And after that, it comes down to a lot of squeezing that last bit of uh, performance um, out. But we can actually do a lot of really quick things. And before we go too much further, I'm going to mention that a lot of these things are not in scope, simply because they've been covered elsewhere or I think there's enough material out there um, on these, and you, I'll put my slides up, so if any of these look very interesting to you, you can always look up the slides and figure out what to do over here. I'm also not covering making everything progressive web app with isomorphic rendering, in part because this has already been covered. And also, 
and, and this is actually a true story. We actually spent a lot of time converting our entire site to a progressive web app, but we still didn't get like that sub-second page load that we really wanted. So let me introduce you to the seven-step program for a fast page load. So my first step is to build a chart. Right? Here's what I made earlier, right? And this is mine. Please, please don't just blindly copy my browser compatibility table. What you really want to do is segment your browsers according to how much you really care about them and how much effort you're willing to put in. So for me, it was the good in which I'm optimizing for speed. Maybe the last five Chromes, Firefox, Edge, Safari, Vivaldi. These are the browsers I really, really care about. And in these, I'm going to spend a lot of time benchmarking my performance and stuff like that. The bad, which is I want it to work, but it's kind of slow. As the previous speaker mentioned, you see browsers up there because it's a pretty big uh, browser in, in, in India. But we care a lot about it to work, but we're OK if it's a little bit slow. And the last category is browsers that you just don't care, right? I'm not going to spend any time trying to figure out how to get this to work on, um, on these um, older browsers, right? Obviously, this should be very much influenced by your actual business, right? I'm not going to make a blanket statement that IE6 is not worth covering or anything like that. Look at your analytics, look at your, um, uh, your actual users, and figure out what they are really using, right? And be ruthless in trying to figure out what you should support. Right? And I'll give a very uh, simple example, which is like something as simple as CSS grids or Flexbox, which is covered by a lot of browsers, but maybe not covered by you know, a lot of the older ones. Your development team can really choose about, do I want to spend about 3x the amount of time writing CSS to handle these old browsers, or do I want to maybe cover this smaller set? And that's something to continuously keep in mind, that supporting older devices costs you actual money, right? In, both in terms of um, you know, uh, coding for the lowest common denominator as well as your dev effort. It's a decision you should be really pragmatic about. And my second and most important step in this uh, program is to profile, right? Which leads me to step number three, profile. And for those in the back, that's uh, profile. And uh, just in case the people on the balcony missed it, profile. Step six is also, well, no, it's not profile. It's make a small change, but then profile, because that's the most um, important step over here. Why? Why should you actually profile your stuff? There's really um, two reasons. So the first is because uh, the speaker of today's talk, that's me, likes to make a lot of claims that uh, you should not believe, right? There are no silver bullets out there because, to quote Leo Tolstoy, all fast pages are alike. Every slow page is slow in its own way. Um, my problems are not your problems, right? I have optimized for a certain set of constraints. You may not care about that. You may have a totally different uh, target audience. So please profile the most important thing. The next question that we want to answer is, what are you going to profile? So unfortunately, there are a lot of things that you actually can profile. And sometimes these are very orthogonal concerns. Right? In order to optimize for one of these, you may end up sacrificing the other one. And it's very, very unfortunate. But, but these are, again, decisions that you'll need to make in a very practical manner for your business. As an example, right? you might care about the first time page load versus the subsequent load, which is jumping from one page to the other, or even coming back uh, a few days later to a different page on your site. Right? And again, this is something that, I, that you know will be very uh, business and domain uh, contextual. So for example, we had a high bounce rate, so we care a lot about the first time page load. And the second time is, you know, it's, it's icing. Time to first contentful paint and time to interactive. And what's above the fold versus the time the entire page is completely uh, loaded. So I'm, you're going to hear this a lot, uh, uh, which is above the fold. So this is what the fold is. Typically, if you look at on your mobile device, whatever is uh, visible on the first screen, and maybe I'd argue maybe 20 or 30% below the bottom of that, that is what everyone refers to as the fold. So now that we know what we're going to profile, and ideally, 
you should have targets for each of these, which is I want my first load to be maybe under a second and subsequent load to be under maybe you know half a second. How, right? So most people don't realize this, but the best tools to actually profile your site are in the browser itself, right? Um, in this example, um, wh what I've actually done is I've clicked on more tools and remote devices, right? If you're building uh, for an audience that's primarily on a mobile device, your best practice should be to actually profile on that device, right? It's not a thing a lot of people know, but just with a simple USB cable, you can turn your, you can attach your Chrome to, um, you know, uh, um, uh, Chrome running inside Android, and you can do a very similar thing between Safari and um, iOS, right? This panel actually will show you a lot of details, which I won't get into. Uh, this is actually a picture of me sitting in an area which has terrible internet connection, trying to figure out why things are slow. The next tool I wanted to show off is something that's known as Google Lighthouse. Uh, just raise your hand if anyone who's seen this. Uh, well, okay, that's about half the audience. So um, Google Lighthouse, I think it showed up maybe last year or the year, uh, uh, just a bit before that. And uh, this actually shows up in the audit tab in, in uh, Google. This is actually one of the most powerful tools for, um, for uh, debugging your actual page speed. And they, and they have releases of this almost every single uh, month. And it, and it just gets better and better. Uh, you can actually run this outside of Chrome as well. And we're going to um, maybe uh, talk about that in a bit. But this actually goes through a, a lot uh, against an actual browser. And it tells you, uh, after simulating your network, and it tells you how long things took to and the last question you want to ask is, well, how, how to profile. And this is one tool that I found very, very um, useful. This is called the Webpack Visual Bundle Analyzer, I think. Yeah, Webpack Bundle Visualizer, sorry. So what this does is it loads up your uh, Webpack Bundle, and it kind of tells you where your different hotspots are. Right? So in my example, I can see that my app.js is 350k, out of which Lodash was 48 kilobytes. This kind of brings me to a myth in today's community that serving large assets with gzip is fine. It's really not. Compression reduces network, but not your processing. Right? And India is actually in a very unique uh, space in this, right? Because I think, whereas maybe various other countries, this, the adoption of kind of higher end uh, smartphones has been a lot higher. Um, in India, the network, especially in like, you know, for example, this, uh, you know, suburbs or slightly rural area, the network has improved thanks to a lot of work by you know, the various telecom companies, but people are still not buying high-end hand uh, phones. So you actually do have a huge amount of people who have a decent-ish network, but terrible uh, low-end uh, smartphones. Which actually brings me to sometimes the best JavaScript is none at all. Um, a lot of people here do React, and everyone thinks about React for the front end, binding, uh, you know, uh, well, rendering onto a, onto a container. But uh, a fun uh, read that I had is the BBC actually uses React only for server-side rendering. They completely do server-side rendering without any client-side rendering at all, just because they felt like their site didn't demand that amount of dynamicism, but even though they enjoyed the, um, the framework. So enough kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, being a bit philosophical. Let's get on to what's the actual quick wins and what this uh, talk is about. So the first thing I'm going to actually say is, you can actually tell the browser what's important in your site. Right? Most sites, or most pages rather, will look some variation of this. You'll open your HTML and you'll have some important CSS. It'll have, you know, maybe some images that are below the fold. And then a bloated third-party JavaScript that, you know, every time it loads, your users are waiting forever. And then finally, your app.js uh, or whatever, whatever you actually need for the interactivity. Your browser is smart, but you can actually make it a lot smarter. This actually brings me to the first uh, tip that you can do, which is, just, which is link headers. What um, uh, the HTTP spec, and also you can embed this in your DOM, allows you to do is uh, allows you to tell your browser that certain resources are important. So in the first line, I say that app.js, please preload it. 
what the browser does in this case is it makes the network request to download this JavaScript ahead of time. As soon as it sees this header, in fact, there's a very good chance that it will start to fetch the, uh, um, the uh, resource. This means that by the time you actually load the, uh, you actually include the JavaScript on your page, it'll already probably be in memory or disk cache or wherever your browser is holding it uh, for you and doesn't need to wait for network at that point. You can actually do this with JSON, uh, with like uh, uh, fetch data as well. So for example, JSON, you can actually send that off to, uh, to preload as well. And one thing that's sort of interesting that not many people will know is that if your CDN supports it, they'll actually do an HTTP2 push for this. So people who are not familiar with HTTP2 push, what that means is when I'm asking for this page, even before you ask me for this JavaScript, the CDN will just give it to you. Right? Again, this is maybe great if you're trying to optimize for the first page load, but of course carries the risk that on the second page load, you might get a duplicate thing. So try to benchmark and see if this is actually worth it. But in our experience, we found this is something that's been really great. The next tip I'm gonna to come to is to inline your CSS, especially the ones that's important. So true story, I think I've spent at least five years trying to figure out how to do critical CSS in the right way. I've tried passing it through Phantom JS and like, you know, every single method that, that is there. But one day, just as an experiment, what I tried was I just took my entire CSS and I just pushed it into the, into the head, right? I didn't even chunk it by page. I just put the entire CSS over there. It turns out it actually worked because anyway, I was downloading the entire CSS and from there you could just improve on it, right? This does, of course, improve your first time page load. So again, you're duplicating it on every single page. So your subsequent loads may suffer a bit, but you know, you have other ways of doing that, including uh, of optimizing that, including with PWA or PJAX or any other way of loading your page and not duplicating it. Uh, just from a security point of view, please remember to sign your CSS just in case you're doing this. But in general, and coming back to the principle of, you know, not making things work so much, compressing your CSS is, um, uh, in, um, like it's probably the best thing you can do to actually uh, reduce things uh, a lot. Right? And um, I know a problem that I've always had, or my team has always had, is we'll first start by writing an application and it'll be great and performant and whatever. But then as requirements change, people will just forget to delete the old, old code. Right? And this is a problem that I've seen many, many uh, people have across uh, different projects where, you know, and, and CSS in particular, because there's no real way to figure out if this, if this block is unused, will just sit around forever and just bloat, bloat things up. So what we found here was CSS modules was actually a great way to kind of slowly uh, fix this for us, right? And I'm not talking about CSS in JS over here, but even though, uh, I mean, they are sort of similar, but what I'm talking about is over here, you can see in the header.js, I'm importing a style and then I'm using that style in this component, right? So in essence, if I stop using this component, this CSS goes away from my, uh, from my CSS bundle, right? Which means that, which just means that I can use my regular webpack, hey, this class is not being used, you really want to import it, as a way of also deleting old, um, old uh, CSS. And another hidden feature that a lot of people don't know in Chrome is that Chrome has added a coverage tab. Uh, I think this was about three months ago. Uh, so Chrome has a coverage tab, which actually tells you what percentage of your CSS and JavaScript is actually being used. So you can see over there in, in the circled bit, this is actually pretty bad on one of my sites. It's about 64% unused. I think our internal target is to get it down to about 30%. Then we'll know that, you know, this is not worth optimizing um, anymore at this point. And the most important uh, of all the CSS that sort of comes through, I would argue, is the font. This is, I think, one place that everyone um, kind of falters when, when building their site. And uh, for those, uh, fonts are great because they really help push the branding of your site. But unfortunately, when you don't deal with them correctly, they end up being pretty slow. So the first thing I wanted to say is please choose your um, FOIT or FOUT uh, strategy. Careful, one second. Okay. Yeah, please choose your FOUT or FOIT strategy uh, very carefully. So, what does that mean? I'm going to explain it, right? 
FOIT is a flash of unstyled, uh, invisible text, and a FOUT is a flash of unstyled text, right? So invisible versus unstyled, that's the difference. Uh, speaking in um, you know, um, English, what that means is while your font is loading, do you want the, all the text to be invisible and then the font suddenly shows up? Or do you want to see a system font and then everything turns into that, into the font that you were trying to load? That's the two strategies. And use font display to choose between these two behaviors. Font display will help you ensure that you choose these two strategies. But actually with this comes a secondary problem that may not be really obvious. By default, what browsers do is every single font that's loaded will cause a re-render of your page. Right? So which means if you're loading four fonts, you have the initial render and then four renders after that. And by four fonts, it's probably two fonts with two different weights, a normal and a bold, which causes about, which caused four renders on your page, right? And typically this will look like if, uh, an earthquake. I don't know if any of you have seen that, but you know, your, 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 your screen's kind of moving a little bit left and right as the fonts uh, get loaded one at a time. There's actually a JavaScript library which will help you on this. It's called the font face observer. What you do is you say, give me a callback when all of my fonts are done. Or, you know, for example, or you can, you know, say two fonts are loaded and four or whatever. You have different uh, options like that. And you can actually control this with CSS. So you would have a class which applies all your fonts at once, which forces the browser at least to do a single re-render as opposed to four uh, re-renders. So let's come to the most, um, heaviest part of your site. And I know that this has been covered, including in, in the talk just before this, but images. Images are actually the single largest contributor to weight, right? About 55% of your page is probably uh, images. So we had a great uh, talk by Rahul at, um, uh, from ImageKit uh, yesterday, but yes, definitely use a service such as Imjix, ImageKit, Tumblr, Cloudflare Polish, or you know any of these to make sure that you're serving the right image for the right uh, device. Right? And of course, please use WebP, which is all great, but I wanted to call out the more, uh, probably the most important uh, mistake that a lot of people who are not familiar with HTML5 do, is please do not choose your image in JavaScript, right? It's going to be ridiculously slow and it's just not worth it. Your image tag has long supported, and the browser support for this is pretty good, has long supported um, a, um, a, a field called source set, right? So what I'm doing over here is I'm saying this image, the source is, you know, large image.jpg, um, and the source set is, uh, and, I'm, and I'm giving a list of images along with the sizes that they, uh, that they correspond to. So small.jpg is 200 pixels, medium.jpg is 400 uh, pixels. And I think most people stop at this, but please remember to put the third parameter which goes along with this. So the third parameter, which is sizes, helps your browser figure out which size it should actually ask for. So what I'm, so what the sizes in my case says is that if the minimum width is 1,024 pixels, that's what I call a desktop, then this image will occupy 25% of my browser screen. That's the VW viewport width. And on a mobile device, it's going to be a big image. It, it takes 100%. Right. So what your um, what your browser actually does is says, I'm on a MacBook 13 inch, that's 1440, and I'm gonna take 25% of that, that's whatever number it is, and I'm gonna pick the image that is slightly bigger than that. Or, and maybe depending on my network, I may choose a smaller one, but the browser handles that for you, right? And this is actually very, very well supported, as long as all these images are in the same aspect ratio. If you're using a different aspect ratio, there's another, there's another tool for this called the picture tag, which you can uh, look up. And of course, lazy load your images. This, and with intersection observer, if you can. I'm calling out with a caveat over here, is lazy load whatever's below the fold. If you lazy load what's above the fold, you're again back to uh, things being slow. I'm gonna go through this quickly because I know this a previous speaker did a great job of covering intersection observer. But over here I have an image, it has a source, which is just an empty GIF. Uh, one cross one pixel just hard coded on the page and it has a data source, which is the actual image. I'm going to create an intersection observer and say that 
start uh, trigger my callback when it comes 100 pixels below the bottom of the screen. I'm going to observe with all of my uh, on e every image that has a data source. And for each on line 15, you'll see that I just set the target source to the data source. Now, this is really great because I'm able to use Intersection Observer, which is a technology, and it, 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 and you can use it as a polyfill on, on older browsers. Polyfills are the greatest because they let you use tomorrow's technology today, right? And people who are not familiar, this is what a, a, a polyfill is, right? Over here, I'm just trying to do new promise, something or the other, and promise is not supported in this browser. And I'm sure everyone knows the solution to this, right? I'm going to import promise polyfill. And uh, just for the heck of it, from the previous example, I'm going to include Babel and Fetch and maybe another few polyfills. The trade-off is that doing this blindly will probably end up with something like this, where you can see over here, Babel polyfill is actually sitting in about 20, uh, whatever, 20% 20 of my, of my bundle. And that's simply not um, ideal because I don't want to make my faster browser slow just because some old browser out there doesn't support uh, promises. Which brings me to my next hack, which is a conditional uh, polyfill, right? So over here, you can see on line two, I actually check if fetch is defined and window.promise is defined. And if it is, I include the entire polyfill, else I just load app. Uh, and then I later load app.js, right? I'm sure there's a Webpack plugin which will do this for you and much faster, but it's frankly just a, like a few lines of code, so we weren't, um, we weren't uh, too bothered with it. This actually does support our overall goal. Oops. Yeah, so this does support our overall goal, which is that, that it's really fast and has no performance penalty on my last five devices. And I think UC browser doesn't support uh, promises and, and it, it'll load it. In fact, every time you load a library, you should um, check your, um, your, your bundle size, right? Not just for polyfills. And I keep having this uh, debate, I think, with different people on my team who tell me stuff like, hey, you know, but when I just added the memory of Chrome just went up sort of by maybe 15 or 16 MB, and should you care about it? So to this, my response is that, you know, 16 MB maybe on the server is not that big a deal. But 16 MB of RAM across 225,000 concurrent users, you're wasting about three and a half ter uh, terabytes of RAM globally. So my argument is it's morally wrong for us to uh, willingly waste RAM. So speaking of libraries, let's play a game. When I say it's 2018, you say we don't need it anymore. Okay, so yeah. So I'm going to start with Lodash. It's 2018 and yep. So um, uh, yeah. So let me kind of get started. I, I know a lot of you will know about this already, which is underscore dot map array and with some function. You could just rewrite that as array dot map. I think you'll kind of see in all of these uh, discussions or these uh, these two or three libraries that I'm going to cover. I'm not saying bad things about these uh, libraries at all. The I, I don't think web development would have been even possible without uh, Lodash in the last uh, I don't know uh, like a uh, few years, but. Browsers have slowly picked up and brought this functionality in-house, which makes a lot of the use cases for these libraries more esoteric or, or, for small, or for more obscure browsers that don't support this anymore. Right? So with that in mind, let's just, uh, don't, don't do this, right? Don't necessarily, uh, even if you do need to use one library from Lodash or say one function, like for example, omit, don't just import underscore from Lodash. The reason is it actually pulls in the entire um, library for you, which can be quite huge. Instead, do this. You can use a totally different tiny library, such as object.omit. If you really want to use Lodash, you can import omit from Lodash slash omit, which is right now my preferred way of doing it. But in Webpack 4, doing import curly omit from Lodash will actually um, reduce and import only that one function thanks to Webpack uh, for tree shaking abilities, right? I couldn't get the last one to work myself, so I'm kind of sticking with the, with the third one, but frankly, removing global imports of the entire Lodash library actually brought down our, our bundle size by about, I think about 30, 40 KB. 
And the next thing, or maybe a little bit more, anyway. Yeah, so the next, next library I want to cover is jQuery. So I'm going to say it's 2018, and you guys will say? Yeah, that's right. right? Um, so jQuery, I'm going to be a bit more um, nuanced, because jQuery, everyone knows it does a lot of things. It's, 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 really, uh, it's a really powerful library that's been around for a long time. But what I found in a lot of my own web apps was that what would happen is I would have most of my app written in React or Vue or whatever else the framework is today. And I just do React, uh, jQuery for a few small things, like for example, fetching some JSON or maybe looking up a DOM, uh, an element in the DOM and binding something to it or rendering React into it. It turns out you can actually get away without jQuery at all for uh, some of these simpler use cases. So here's an example a bit of code um, with uh, jQuery. I'm querying a link, and when I click on it, I'm going to add a CSS class, and I'm going to hide it over 500 milliseconds, and I'm going to do some dollar dot, uh, I mean, yeah, get JSON. And the equivalent in not jQuery is very similar. I use document.query selector or document.query selector all uh, to, to fetch my items. I'm just going to do dot class list dot add to uh, add my class. And I'm going to use a CSS transition to handle the 500 millisecond uh, um, shrinking. And of course, we have fetch instead of, um, instead of, the, um, instead of the JSON APIs. And once again, I'm going to caveat this. I know that there's a, uh, there's a huge wealth of libraries that are out there that are built on jQuery. And I'm not going to pretend as if you, know, you can get rid of all of them overnight. But it is still a starting point for you to think. Right? Once again, jQuery came in at a point where browser support for query selector and query selector all was pretty pathetic. And, and you know, everyone would be implementing it in a certain way. But as we've moved on to 2018, uh, things have gotten a lot, a lot uh, better. So the last library I'm going to cover, but maybe not spend any time on it because we're out of time, is Moment. Um, I know I, I love Moment a lot. It's great for date manipulations, and it's great for, um, well, anything to do with uh, times and dates. But I found that if I'm only using uh, uh, something like to print out the current date, you can actually do this with a lot uh, smaller libraries as well. The reason for this is Moment actually comes pre-bundled with a bunch of locales. So if you just import Moment and don't do anything to prevent this, it'll come in with like Dutch support and German and like uh, every language almost that you could think of which ended up bloating things quite a bit. So just in conclusion, uh, some final thoughts. Although we were a PWA, that wasn't nearly enough to get us to a sub-second page load, right? In fact, you'll probably find that progressive web apps are all optimized for subsequent page loads and do very little for your first time uh, page. Using a lot of these tricks, as well as you know, some of the PWA stuff, we brought our first uh, contentful paint down from about 350 milliseconds to 90% and saw somewhere between a 35 and a 50% increase in traffic. And this should be a continuous uh, journey, right? I've seen a lot of teams thinking about like a perf day where we'll make everything slow for like a month and then, you know, one day we'll sort of clean it up. That's, not, that's never a great idea because perf day never shows up. Every day should be performance uh, day. And the last thing I'll say is the easiest way to get that to work is to measure your important metrics as part of CI. Lighthouse is now available as an NPM module and can launch Chrome in headless mode and generate your response as a JSON response. It's very easy to run this um, every minute or every hour or whatever your, your capabilities are. And in fact, there are even services out there which will do this for you. There's one called trio.sh, I think that's, which will just run Lighthouse against your site every minute and, and tell you what your speed is and alert you when things are bad. In closing, I wanted to link to some great resources that I found. The first is the Chrome Developer Podcast, right? It's called HTTP 203 Non-Authoritative Content. This one's really great. They publish about a video every three days and Every single video, I'm like, wow, I didn't know about this. I think last week they did a great video on um, some of the new browser features, which actually let you measure performance in the browser. So that's navigator.performance, and um, it has a great amount of stuff on that. Um, 
I of course showed you Webpack Visualizer, and the last thing I want to show you is, or will not show, but is CSSStats.com, in which you can actually, um, it will actually go through your site and tell you these are how many fonts you've used, these are how many sizes you've used, these are how many colors you've used, and give you a bunch of stats. And as I have three seconds left on the clock, I'm done. Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone. Wow. Uh, before asking questions, I just have a couple of announcements. So there is a BOF on how to travel the world as a remote developer, like freelancing stuff. And then there are two meta refresh tracks are going on, like designing for voice and voice and VR interfaces. Uh, please take the feedback forms and fill it. Like every feedback forms are uh, end of the row. Uh, and then there is a break up to 420. You can continue questions. Yeah, so if there's any questions, uh, raise your hand or however else they handle it. I'm not sure. Hey. Yeah. I'm here straight. Wait, where? My left or my yeah. right? Ah, hi. Yeah, hello. So uh, I just wanted to know how do you do, uh, how, how is our above the fold rendering done? So About the? Above the fold. Above the fold, yeah. Yeah, so what I understand is, uh, so if a user opens a website on his uh, laptop per se, yeah. so uh, the screen that he, so the screen height which he, uh, which he is currently seeing, that is being rendered server side and the rest of it is rendered client side, right? Yes. Uh, uh, so uh, I just wanted to know how is it, uh, how is this done? Matlab, where is the logic being written for this? Um, okay, so I think this kind of comes to, um, uh, well, really, what is the responsive uh, design, right? Obviously, um, um, there are two approaches to this. One is if um, if you're relying on your C uh, a CDN or something to do a lot of HTTP caching, then then what we like to do is to render the, uh, to give the same uh, HTML back to both the mobile and the and the and the and the desktop, and then render it in CSS, I mean, and render it with, with uh, query selectors and whatever. And you can do a different approach if you don't rely on caching very much. But uh, to answer your specific uh, question, I think at least what we do is um, this, the server side kind of will render whatever is above the fold for both the mobile and desktop. I think at least we, we've been kind of lucky in that the number of resources isn't drastically different. Like you might be able to see, um, like uh, five images on on uh, on mobile versus say twelve or seventeen on the on the desktop. We found that the penalty for that hasn't been too high though, even though mobile only is using five or six of those seventeen uh, resources. Hi, Hi. Here. Yeah, nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, so what I wanted to know uh, is. Look, we always talk about that uh, lazy load your image, lazy load your images, yeah. but then there are some times where are pages where images are like a placeholder at least otherwise where the thing will start coming up. Let's yes. say I wanted, uh, what is it, parallax type style, or I want my styles to scroll up based where I am on the browser. Right. But if I have not loaded the image, that space will be empty, how to handle that part? Right, so, th so that's why I think, like, I think the previous talk also covered this um, uh, pretty well, which is that I think the earlier way of doing this was, um, you would use a lot of, um, like for example, jQuery, which would listen on scroll width, which would then uh, calculate, for example, dot get bounding uh, rectangle, typically to figure out which, which of your images are coming into view. That actually was really, really slow. Uh, the reason being that, and um, uh, when you start debugging with the, with, with the Chrome profiler, you'll see something a lot called reflows, right? Which is what it's actually doing when the, when the browser is actually trying to query, figure out what's on the screen and kind of reshape everything. Even calling, uh, trying to figure out the position of an image with, with dot uh, get bounding rectangle actually calls, uh, causes a reflow. And, and that was actually one of the reasons why this would be really, really slow. If you look at the intersection observer API, I'm just gonna go back to that um, uh, specific slide. Um, where is it? Uh, anyway, if you look at the intersection observer um, uh, API, it actually gives you a lot of um, ways to very easily um, uh, deal with this, right? So you can actually say that um, that um, if you see line number six, it actually tells you that hun uh, 100 pixels or 300 pixels below my screen is when you should start loading. So that should give you a sufficient buffer, one. And two is because intersection observer itself comes pre-bundled with your browser, there, 
there's no question of the li of any external library loading before this loads. Uh, there's two things. I'm not sure about the support of this yet. Intersection observer. Yep. So right? it's uh, in, in my um, in my screen. It's actually it, it's actually reasonably well supported. I believe Safari. I mean, mobile Safari and desktop Safari also has support. UC browser is the only one that, if I remember, you need to worry about, which is a no, which is. Favorite IE. IE edges edge supports uh, intersection observer, if I'm not mistaken, and I think I I I'll need to I'll need to check the chart. Uh, on a counter question on that, when we say lazy load, mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that there are now if you see browsers, your browser doesn't load your page from the top of it. So if a user has scrolled, so say let's say 50 percent of the screen, and then he scroll uh, refreshes the page, the actually the page loads at the 50 percent of them. Wasn't that lady, uh, lazy load will fail at those situations? Uh, can you repeat the question? So, Are you saying you're looking at the So for example, of the page I'm below? scrolling a uh, page where let's say my page was like three times the screen size. Okay. Yeah. I've scrolled the second half of the page. Yes. When I refresh the page, what the browser automatically does it for me, it loaded, loads from there. Instead of loading it from the start of the page, it loads me from the middle of the page where I was last scroll was. Sure. So was, wouldn't lazy load will not allow me to know what is going to be load preloaded? Mm. Well, let me let me let me think about that. Like, um, what I will say is that intersection observer I can see is very very light. So, frankly, even if you um, are at fifty percent of the page or whatever, intersection observer will figure out pretty instantly that you're at that fifty percent and it will immediately trigger the 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 callbacks for those images. And if you see the way intersection observer actually works, it says twenty pixels above the page, hundred pixels below. That's my example over here. So it won't load all the images that it took for you to get to that page. So so whatever's on the first half of the page, it won't load that, it'll just load whatever's in the second half. Um, I'm not sure if it solves that specific uh, use case, which is somehow you loaded the page at the 50% mark. Yes, if you don't lazy load the image, it'll, it, that, for that micro benchmark, it might be a bit faster. But I think overall, what we've seen, including on UC browser, is that um, it's a pretty seamless experience, especially if you polyfill this um, in advance.